Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody back with us, and uh, we are going to be looking right where we left off in our last program, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to jump in at verse 9, although we did get to verse 11. Okay, for those of you joining us on television, how we appreciate a letter like we got yesterday. She said, I even feel like I love all the people in your studio audience. And uh, she said, I just feel like I'm a part of them. Well, evidently, we're coming across the way we intend, that those of you watching on television can actually feel like you're right here in the class with us. And so we like to extend a special welcome to those of you from wherever you are. Now, again, we always like to remind our audience that we do have all the past programs, and believe it or not, this is the 80th time that we've been in the Tulsa now to tape four programs. And all these programs are available on video as well as in the printed page. And so if you're interested in that, you give us a call on the 800 number or write us a note and we'll get them back to you. I don't know how many thousands of book Iris figured up the other day have already gone out, but it's, it's a bunch of them. And Jerry, our transcriber, is here again today. Jerry's the one who transcribes all the tapes into the printed page and gets it ready for the folk up here. Okay, now then let's get into what this program is all about. Pretty much a verse by verse study of the Word, and as we've already indicated, we've come all the way up from Genesis, and now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll start again at verse 9, and then down to where we left off in verse 11. And remember the background for the letter to Corinthians. I can't emphasize it too much or too often. This was a unique situation. This was a unique congregation of believers, unlike, I think, anything else that Paul experienced. Because, you see, Corinth was such a bustling commercial city located between two seaports. And so you had people coming in from all over the then known world, tremendous exchange of money and wealth and culture and all the rest of it. But the main thing you have to understand as you read Corinthians is that the city of Corinth was steeped in paganism, in pagan, idolatrous, and the worship of the Greek gods and goddesses and what have you. And so with that kind of a background and such gross immorality, now of course we think it's getting bad in America, but listen, we haven't quite reached yet the level of Corinth. We'll probably get there before long at the rate we're sliding, but as yet we are not as far down the tube as Corinth was. And so here is where Paul now, as he writes to these Corinthian believers, just recently converted out of that kind of a lifestyle. Now look what he says in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. In other words, don't you think for a minute that just because God is a God of love and God is gracious and God is merciful, that he is going to let these kind of people into his heaven short of their salvation. All right, and so look what he says neither fornicators, in other words, the grossly immoral people, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, or the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. They are in the hands of Satan, and they're going to be where Satan will be for all eternity, but they don't have to be. Now look at the next verse. And such, what's the next word? Were, past tense. And such were, he says, some of you. And now you are washed. In other words, they've been cleansed of all their wickedness. But you are sanctified. They were now set apart for God's purposes. You are justified, and now if you remember how we studied in Romans that 
Justification is that judicial act of God whereby he declares the sinner just as if they'd never sinned. In other words, God cleanses the idolater as though he had never fallen down before an idol. He justifies the drunkard as though he had never taken a drink. He justifies the adulterer as though he had never committed adultery. Now, this is the beauty, of course, of salvation by grace. And so he says, you're washed. Now, this is not a Pauline concept. You know, I'm always emphasizing so much of what Paul writes. But turn back with me to John's Gospel, if you will, where the Lord Jesus himself uses the term with regard, of course, to the twelve or the eleven. Judas never was, but the eleven. In John, I said twelve, thirteen. I'm sorry, honey. In John 13. And here we have Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. You all know the account, probably better than I do. And you're taking the John 13 and down to verse 6. Well, verse 5 is where it really begins. John chapter 13, verse 5. And after that he poureth water into a basin, that is the Lord Jesus now, and this is again just shortly before his crucifixion, the end of his three years. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And he cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. And you know I'm always emphasizing how that Scripture and God dealing with men is a progressive thing. In the same way, this is so true. Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing right now, but he would somewhere down the road. All right, and then Simon Peter said, verse 9, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my feet. In other words, what's Peter saying? Well, if washing my feet will do this much, then give me a bath. My, what greater experience than have the Lord of glory give you a total bath? And Peter wasn't <laughs> the least bit shy about the matter. And so he says, well, if that's the case, give me a bath. Wash me all over. All right, verse 10. And Jesus said unto him, He that is washed, past tense now, he that is washed needeth not another washing except to wash his feet. But he is clean, every whit. And you are clean, he says to Peter, but not all. Now he's not talking about part of Peter's body. He's talking about the twelfth man who was Judas, which you pick up in verse 11. For he, the Lord Jesus, knew who should betray him. Therefore, said he, you are not all clean. So it wasn't that he was in indicating that Peter's salvation wasn't complete. That it was. But why then need the foot washing? Well, you see, as I've explained before, I think even on the program, the main place of bathing were the public baths. And after they had left the public bath with nothing but their sandals and so forth, uh, not shoes as we wear them, and not nice paved or asphaltic streets and sidewalks, they had to go down those old filthy, dirty, dusty streets. Well, by the time they got back home, what condition were their feet in? They were again filthy. So did he have to go back and get another bath? No. He'd had his bodily bath, but he had to wash the feet. All right, the indication is then it's the same thing in our Christian experience. Once we've been saved, we're washed, see? And now come back to 1 Corinthians, and this is what he's even telling these horrible Corinthians who had been in the most <coughs> gross of sins. And I was thinking on the way up again, you know, we're living in a society where a good percentage, at least in America, a good percentage of our people have had a, at least some exposure to the Scriptures. They've probably been to Sunday school when they were kids. A lot of denominations put their children through catechism and so forth, and it at least, at least exposes them to some of the things of the Bible. But these people had none. They knew absolutely nothing of the things of God. They knew nothing of Adam. They knew nothing of Abraham. They knew nothing of Moses and the law. They were pagan. They were idol worshipers. And I, I mentioned to one of the classes the other night when we were in Corinth, through the ruins of Corinth, way up on, a, on an outcropping, way up high, almost been a couple hundred feet at least, almost a sheer cliff. Clear at the top, of course, is this temple to the goddesses. And I have to stop and ask the guide, how in the world did they get the building material from down here to up there? Slave labor. 
umpteen hours of hard work, not to build some beautiful library, not to build some beautiful campus or place of education, but a temple to a female goddess. Imagine. But see, that's all they live for. Whatever they could work and sweat and do to somehow appease their gods and goddesses. Now, this wasn't just Corinth. It was the whole ancient world, see? All right, now then, along with the worship of these goddesses, was even worse than the worship of the male gods, was gross immorality. And I pointed this out almost every program since we've been in Corinthians, that this gross immorality was just a part and parcel of their everyday experience. They didn't know any different. And it wasn't just the common people. It was all the way to the top, see? All right, now then, coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and so he says, Such were some of you, but now you're washed. Now, just like Peter and the other ten men, they had their salvation, they were washed of their sins and of their iniquity, and so were these Corinthians. So what does it always boil down to? Just like Paul said in, in Romans, I think, chapter, chapter 3, that where sin abounded, what always is greater? God's grace, see? God's grace, that where sin abounds, God's grace is always greater if the individual wants to partake of it. All right. Now then he says in the very next verse, uh, I lost my place. I was in chapter 6. I'm in 3. Okay. And he says, You are washed, you are sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now here again is the working of the whole three persons of the Godhead. God the Father, in, in heaven looks down, of course, on sinful men. And the Holy Spirit, in turn, convicts sinful men of the finished work of God the Son. And so the whole triune God comes in and washes these kind of people of which you and I were no different. Oh, we may not have been steeped in idolatry. We may not have been practicing gross immorality, but the potential was there. My heart was born just as wicked as these Corinthians, and so was yours. But as a result of the grace of God and the finished work of the cross and our faith in it, we too have been washed, sanctified, and justified. Now, verse 12. This may throw a curve at people, and a lot of times I think, well, I'm going to skip some of these verses as I get ready for this. And I thought, no, I can't. Uh, I, I can't skip a verse like 12, where Paul now writes all things, everything, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought in the power of any. Now, what is Paul saying? Is Paul saying, I can go ahead and steal? Is Paul saying, I can go ahead and commit adultery? I can go ahead and covet? No. What he's really saying is that he is no longer under that demanding burden of the law, and he's now under grace. Now let's go back and compare some scriptures that maybe we've looked at previously. Uh, come back for just a second to Romans chapter 6 again. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans chapter 6. Verse 14, here's where we get it the clearest, and this is where we spent a lot of time when we were back there in Romans. Romans 6, verse 14, where he writes, For sin, or your old Adamic nature, shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, you're under grace. Now then, if you're not under the law, then what? It doesn't have any effect on you. See, and that's what he means back here in Corinthians. All things are lawful because I'm not under the law. All right, now while you're still in Romans, turn a minute, I think it's chapter 13. thought just came to mind. I hope I'm not getting myself in a jam. Uh, sometimes I do, you know. A thought comes and I think I can turn right to it and then I can't. And uh, maybe that's what happened here. But um, it's right here in Romans someplace. Yeah, chapter 7. 
I was going too far. Romans chapter 7, just across the page, in fact. Romans 7, verse 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh, in other words, we were like those Corinthians. Such were some of you. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, in other words, all the things that the law was revealing, that being dead wherein we were held, that is, by the law. Now, of course, Paul can write that way, being a Jew himself. That we should serve in newness of what? Spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. Well, what's he saying? That we're no longer under those demands of the Ten Commandments of Moses. We are now under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, be logical. Will the Holy Spirit ever lead a believer to do something contrary to the law? No, of course not. The Holy Spirit will never lead someone into adultery. The Holy Spirit will never lead someone into idolatry. It's logical, isn't it? But without that burden of the law and the fear that, oh, what if I break it? We now have grace and the Holy Spirit is the one who leads us and guides us and directs us so that we keep the law. But it's under a whole different set of circumstances. And that's exactly, and I'll come back to 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 6 rather, and that's exactly what Paul is talking about here when he says that all things are lawful. He is not under that burden of the law per se. He is free from that. But he's not going to take advantage of it and make license of it because the Holy Spirit now is controlling every facet of his life and so it should be with us. All right. All things are lawful for me because I'm not under the law. But I will not be brought under the power of any that is of those things that the law forbids. All right. Now verse 13 on, he's going to come into something that uh, we're going to cover a little more in detail, I think, when we get over to chapter 8. But uh, in verse 13 now, he brings out one of the physical aspects of everyday life, and that is, now 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, meats for the belly, or food for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God shall destroy both it and them. In other words, those are part of our temporal existence. We can't go a day, hardly, without food. The stomach begins to rumble and roll and roar, and we get hungry. All right, that's the way God intended. But the day is coming. That won't be true. When we get our new resurrected body, we're not going to have to eat three meals a day. I think for those of us who love to eat, the Lord's going to have the pleasure of eating. I, I really think that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done it there at the Sea of Galilee. And you know he ate fish that morning, and I imagine, like me, he had some bread. Uh, nothing I like better for breakfast than just plain fish and bread. But anyway, it's not going to need it. It's not going to be something that the body is going to demand day after day. And so this is part of our temporal existence. Food for the stomach, stomach for the food. Now he goes on into another area of everyday life, and that's the sexuality. And so he says the body is not for fornication. The body was not created for man to live immorally, but it was created to bring honor and glory to whom? To God himself. That's why he created us. All right, so the body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord, and the Lord in turn is for the body. It's a two-way street. Now verse 14, And God hath both raised up the Lord, and he will also raise us up by his own power. Now, here's just one little, what shall I say, introduction to resurrection, which is going to come full blast when we get to chapter 15. And when we get to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, we're going to see more on resurrection in that one chapter, I think, than in all the rest of Scripture put together. But see, Paul is just sort of wetting our appetite here, just giving us a little inkling of that which is yet to come. All right, and so as Christ was raised up, so also we will be raised up by his own power. And I'll make more comment on that, comment on that concerning the Greek uh, philosophy and so forth when we get to chapter 15. Now verse 15. Know you not. Now reverse that a little bit. You know. 
Paul says. Well, how did they know? Well, he was with them long enough to lay out all of these biblical principles of morality and spirituality. Now, he wasn't with them long. See, now, I was telling one of my class the other night, when you stop to think about it, if it hadn't been for the miraculous working power of God, Christianity would have never gotten off the ground. It was just an impossible set of odds. Because all these people were so steeped in idolatry, except the Jewish element, and they were just as steeped in their Judaism, that had it not been for the miraculous working of Paul, it would have never survived. Because Paul wasn't in any one place that long. See, now I can see the church of Jerusalem uh, prospering to a certain degree because the, the 11, later on the 12 again, came back, continued the ministry that Christ begun, and they stayed there year in and year out, working amongst those Jews in Israel. But every place that Paul established a church, it was only for a week or two, and Antioch, of course, a year and a half. But for the most part, Thessalonica, I think only a couple weeks, and he moved on. How in the world did those new believers, fresh out of paganism, how did they make it? Well, I can't understand it, except that it was the miraculous power of God that Christianity was now to take off and start permeating the whole Roman Empire. But all right, he says, don't you know, or like I said, reverse it, you know that your bodies are the members of Christ. Now remember, he's talking to believers. Even these carnal people at the church of Corinth, but they were believers. And he says, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? God forbid. Now, you see, we think this is horrible language. What's the Bible got this in here for? Hey, this was their whole lifestyle. I've pointed out in the last series of programs. My, from that, from that temple of the goddess Aphrodite up there on that, on that bluff above the city, 1,000 female priestesses serving in the temple. But at night, where'd they go? Down into the city of Corinth, 1,000 of them. And the men were confronted with that every night of the week. And so this is why the Bible is so explicit. It was so rampant, and that it didn't stop there. Their, their immorality went to the very depth, see? And we're seeing it happening in, in our own country today. I guess maybe that's why this letter is now becoming more appropriate, huh? Because even our society is getting closer and closer to that of Corinth. All right, now verse 16. What? Don't you know that he who is joined, that is sexually, to a harlot is one body? For two, he saith, shall be one flesh. Where's Paul get this? Well, go back to Genesis. Let's go back a moment. It's been a long time since we've taught Genesis. Chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let's just jump in at verse 21. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib with which God had taken from man he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And now verse 23, the man, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In other words, the Hebrew word for man is ish. I-S-H, and the word for woman is just with an A added on the last. It's Isha, and so Ish and Isha are man and woman because she was taken out of man. All right, now then, verse 24. Here it is. This is what Paul is still resting on. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave or cling and hang on to his wife, and they, that man and woman, shall be what? One flesh. Now, in our present-day weddings, you know, the kids like to have two candles burning, and then at the end of the ceremony, they snuff the two, and they light how many? One. Well, that's the whole concept. 
But you see, they take it so lightly. And I read again the other day, one of our polls, I don't know who took it, you know, polls can lie like everything else, I guess, but I read them. But a recent poll was taken and over 50% of young married couples who have just been married within a month, over 50% expected their marriage to end up in divorce within the first year or two. I mean, that's their attitude. Now, this is shocking. I know it is. But no wonder they don't last. They go in with no commitment. And you know why they do it? Because the church has failed to teach our young people. Our young people no longer understand these biblical promises of marriage and sex and kids and all the rest. It's completely unknown to them. And so consequently, I'm coming back to 1 Corinthians now, consequently they can enter into this marriage relationship with no commitment, with no moral foundation, no anchor, and no wonder we're in trouble. But you see, the biblical concept has never changed from the Garden of Eden to this day tonight. And that is, God intended one man married for life to one woman. And if death interrupted it, as we'll be seeing over in chapter 7, if death interrupted it, yes, then they were free to remarry. But other than that, God's original plan was one man for one woman. Now you remember even the taunters of Jesus. What did they throw up to Jesus? Well, Moses granted a writing of divorcement. How about that? Well, what was Jesus' answer? Granted. He said, because of your sin, Moses granted writings of divorcement. But Jesus said, in the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, when God laid out the format for marriage and family, it was one man for one woman until death do them part. All right, now then if you'll come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for a few seconds that we have left. He said, don't you know that if you're joined to a harlot or a prostitute, you become one with that prostitute? All right, that's, that's some sobering thinking, isn't it? And so consequently then he says, flee immorality. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.